Hello, good morning, and welcome to the latest Historics Refuel podcast. Today, we are on location here at the Silverstone Festival with plenty of classic cars to boot ahead of our auction, of course, at Ascot Racecourse. Now, before I get to my special guest, there's someone very important here I want you to meet. This here is Nick Wigley, event director from Hi, Silverstone. Hi, Matt. Um, we're just going to quickly run through a few things with you. Uh, tell me, how has the whole event evolved since your involvement with it? Has it brought in more of a younger audience? Oh, very much so. If you go back to 2009, which was when I first got involved in this, it was for enthusiasts, race enthusiasts only. And we've concentrated on the over the last 16, 17 years now uh, of really trying to put in the family feel into it by putting on lots more entertainment. And of course, when they come, they love the motor racing. But that's not necessarily the main reason why the family comes. No. But they love it when they do come. But it's important, isn't it? It's important to get those people into the industry. Otherwise, in 30 years' time, this wouldn't exist. Same with us in selling cars. You do need to have these new new audiences, these young people get involved and feel that ev evocative nature of being around a race circuit. Yeah, absolutely. And it is a fantastic feeling. I mean, you never get anybody coming away from an event like this saying, oh my God, what a boring event. I mean, they just absolutely love it. And what you hear people say is, I wish I'd spent more time there because I just did not see everything. Right, let's, let's wander in here and have a quick look around some of the cars prepping to go out on track. Right, so this is obviously a hub of activity here. What's happening here? Okay, so we invite somewhere between 800 and 1,000 cars. We have two pits and paddocks. Those cars are distributed amongst the pits and pit garages exactly in the same way as Formula One is, except that with Formula One, you get one car in the garage. We've got between eight, eight, 900 cars here racing. So they are, as you can see, six or seven abreast in the garage with all the tires, all the fuel, everything, you know, to help support the, the racing. And what is fantastic is it's also full of us. Yeah, the, the, the walking public having to be able to walk around these machines probably irritate the owners I'm sure but it's very integrated with the audience here which is fantastic isn't it now have you got a highlight for the weekend a highlight for the weekend what beyond the racing right collection of Ayrton Senna's cars never been seen before I think the highest number is about seven or eight cars ever we've got 25 of the cars basically spanning his entire career over there in a display Fantastic. Right, well, I've got to head off over to the National Paddock now to meet our special guest. Before I go there, and I'll leave on this high note, tell me one unpopular opinion you may have about motorsports and or Formula One. Well, I probably don't have any unpopular ones, but I, probably Formula One may be considered elitist, unobtainable, maybe a little at the top end of the market pricey. Unlike this fantastic event, which is much more affordable, and for the family to come and enjoy and see and touch everything. Ultimately, motorsport should be for everyone, cars should be for everyone, so we enjoy these petrol head moments for many years to come. Nick, thank you very much for your time. Lovely to meet you and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Let's head on over. Oh, hello, hello. Hello. Welcome over to the National Paddock, and this is my special guest. Amanda Stredden, race car driver, broadcaster extraordinaire. How are you? <laughs> I'm very good. I like the intro. And, and clearly you've not come as fancy dress. You have been racing. I have, yes. I'm driving in the pre-63 GT race in a TR4, which was um, fun. Just had our qualifying. Good, good. And you did well? Well, we brought the car back. Well, that's the main thing. And uh, no, I'm looking forward to the race. Yeah, it's a bit like landing a plane. Any landing's a good landing, yeah? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, we went out on track. Neither of us had seen the car much. I, it was the first time I saw it this morning. Um, a quick lesson in, you know, where everything is and what I need to know. So, yes, three well, laps. Oh, it's been a busy week for you, hasn't it? Because the, the one thing I wanted to initially talk about is that you've, um, you're the master of ceremonies at Pebble Beach, so you've only just flown back. I am, yes. I got back um, day before yesterday, so still a bit jet-lagged. Yes. Very jet-lagged, yes, actually. Yes, very. Um, having spent nearly two weeks out there getting ready for that. Um, but no, it's good to be back, but that is an extraordinary event. Isn't it, Jess? I was watching, actually, I was watching through your social media this morning, and some of the early mornings as it starts as well. Oh. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive, but my word. It is, I know. So on the day of show, um, there's this thing called Dawn Patrol, which started 
I don't know, 20 odd years ago or so, um, where it sort of became a competition about which cars could actually get there first. <laughs> They've all got their pre-assigned space, so everybody knows that they're going to have space yeah. on the green, um, but it's just who gets there first. So the cars, I mean, the first cars were there at 2.20. We got there, my alarm was 3.45. And I was astonished when I came out of my room to see cars parked outside my room. <laughs> Just so they could be first on the lawn. I know. That's I crazy, know. isn't it? And how was the event? Beautiful as usual, I bet. Beautiful. Um, I mean, it was a, it's, a, it's an incredibly special event and um, it's a huge honour for me to be a part of the team. Um, but I, I'll talk about that as well because, I mean, I think I can wax, wax lyrical yeah, about that. Um, but th the event is fantastic yeah. because everybody... You know, it's the, it's the cars that you sort of only dream of seeing all in one place. So that's the first thing. But that you know, all the owners are so keen to share their stories. So it's not a case of these cars being museum pieces and sort of kept under wraps. No, no. People want to show their cars and talk about them. Which and is which is key. We don't, we don't want them hidden away. No, and so they're real real enthusiasts. And it's one of the you know one of the four or five big big events that. Mm the big, big cars definitely then come out for. Oh. I mean, if we didn't have those events, some of those cars, you're right, wouldn't really be seen. No, and I think it's really good as well that, um, you know, part, part of the Concours, people think of it as just a static thing, but of course, part of the Concours is actually doing the, um, the tour yep. on the Thursday before, so you get sort of bonus points, if you like, for taking part, sort of proving that the cars aren't just trailer queens, which is what many people think when they think of a Concours. These yes. cars are actually driven, used and enjoyed very much on the road. And I mean, if you can't enjoy driving down to Big Sur, then... <laughs> exactly, then you may as well not be in the car at all, well, yeah. let's be honest. I mean, it's all about the enjoyment as well. But that brings us on to the enjoyment of cars and also how the main topic of this podcast about how brands are commercialising of the sort of modern Formula One and racing has, has started to help to try and re-engage people into classic cars. Because the worry from, from our point of view, from anyone that enjoys classic cars is, is the next generation going to continue mm. with the same spirit, the same luster for these cars? And then Drive to Survive came on with Formula One and seemed to have picked up a nice younger audience. There's, I think Drive to Survive has definitely had a huge impact engaging with an audience that wasn't already interested yeah. in racing. Yeah. Um, I talk to people now who literally have had no interest whatsoever Until and are later. now totally engrossed in the stories yeah. um, behind it. I'm not sure that um, it's necessarily going to be bringing many people into the racing, but I think just engaging with the sport is... We think it's that engagement with uh, motorsport, although it, it can phase into uh, you know electric cars and what have you, it re-engages people with the idea of a car being something you cherish and want to, mm. to love, to, to race, yeah. to own, which the concern, of course, is that with, with modern cars, and if you think of a teenager now and they're coming about to drive, every car is seen as almost like white goods. It's becoming mm. almost a dis disposable item. So the idea of this this sudden impact, and it is to do with media, because obviously what they want is someone to watch. Yeah, I think also a lot of the, I mean, I noticed sort of 15 odd years ago, um, a lot of the manufacturers also really started engaging with their heritage. You know, when I first started knocking around in historic cars, I mean, we would rock up here with our stuff in the car, having driven the car here ourselves. Yes. You know, our kit in, leaving it on the tarmac somewhere under a tonneau cover, going out racing, putting it all back in the car and driving back home again. And then sort of manufacturers really started to say engaging with that heritage and sort of running their own programs. And I think that also w was a real, real big turning point. Yes, yes. Um, heritage selling the modern car. Yeah, but, well, I think I always say to people with modern cars and modern racing, you can't understand, you can't ever look at it in isolation. You've no. got to be able to, you've got to understand the heritage and where it all came from. Um, whether you're talking about design, whether you're talking about technology, it all... Yeah. Nothing Nothing happens in a vacuum. It, there is something that happened before. And there's that strange sort of change as well with, with branding. I mean, think of Red Bull. I mean, it's not a car manufacturer, mm. but it's a race team now. And it's the idea of it sells the brand. So brands are happy to then attach themselves to these events, to these these teams. But because of that association, I mean, favourite, I mean, with things like the old I mean, Jägermeister, 
bright yeah. orange cars. The uh, you've still got to see the martini cars with the livery. They become as iconic as the car Com- themselves. Golf, yeah, exactly. Well, I mean that's so, a fuel company, but, but yeah. yes. But you know the Marlboro on the of um, on the old Ferrari. It, it all becomes part and parcel of what you remember, and it sells that brand. But that brand is necessary at the moment to to fuel some of these sports. Complete. And I, I, just slightly on a tangent, my daughter loves old race kit. Oh, but I mean, yeah. the sort of 60s, 70s, yeah. um, almost like the sort of Hesketh area, you know, I mean, who doesn't? But that sort of, as you say, that branding, that yeah. brand identity, it's really strong. I think it's, and I say, a big key to us trying to keep this whole market moving in the right direction. We have, we have this constant worry from clients when they own their cars, sell, oh, but classic cars are going to, they're not going to die out because we all have this full circle, mm. you know, look at, for instance, when BMW recreated the Mini, but they made it look like the old Mini because we do like to reflect on history, which is why the brands get so heavily involved in heritage. I thought um, actually just last week in, in America, looking at um, all of the auctions there, it was really interesting actually seeing what was moving really strong and what wasn't and where the dips dips yes, were you yes. know it's quite interesting that 50 sports cars were sort of struggling a little bit some of the pre-war stuff is back to being really strong yes. and then you look at the sort of 60s and 70s even 80s stuff you know an f50 sold for that's bonkers i mean it? it was just absolutely mad it was like yeah. five million dollars and i think that i mean we always we always know this that there is a certain amount that tracks with the age groups of course because yeah. a certain times of people's lives they have more disposable income or they've made their money so therefore they're more likely to spend but you're quite right on the the pre-war cars because they to be fair they'd had a terrible ride in the last five six years for for obvious reasons but dare i say it what's left is so special that people appreciate the heritage of it and actually want to re-engage but do you know what i want to do i mean i've got a bit of a sort of hankering to to get back into trialing I oh, want to get yeah. a Charles car. But how great, because it's so different from what you will do day to day in a Completely. car. It's, it's, like, it's like driving a puzzle is the only way yeah. I can put it. I mean, if I put most, almost every single modern driver that doesn't have any kind of uh, affiliation to it, pop in a pre-war car, start that car, oh yeah, they wouldn't have a clue. And no. actually that's half the joy of it. It's like driving a digger or a helicopter. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so complicated until you've got the hang of it. Yeah. And then it becomes a skill that you can master and appreciate much easier than you know just in a modern car i mean you really have to be on a track well, to really race a modern car you do absolutely but you say that i was um luckily luckily lucky enough to drive a speed six bentley yeah. um on the tour on the thursday i hadn't driven a crash gearbox for like 20 years yeah. and only about half i think being generous of my gear changes were okay <laughs> The rest were pretty you, rubbish. You always, when you get them, when someone gives you the car like that, you always think, "Can I just go and hide and learn this myself for a minute before anyone watches?" Because I know. You do think it takes a bit of movement and a bit of getting <laughs> used to again before you can go. Oh, seamless! Nailed it. Yes, yeah. exactly. So, with all of this this change and trying to bring youth into, it, obviously important is also trying to get more females into motor racing and into motor enthusiasm. And obviously, years and years ago, and we're still seeing it now. Obviously, it's a, a predominantly male orientated sport, but it shouldn't be. There's no reason for it to be. Uh, have you seen the demographics starting to shift more and more? Massively. And I think it's brilliant, I have yeah. to say. Um, I always say the car doesn't know your gender. Correct. So there is no reason why no. there shouldn't be more women. Um, I remember, when, you know, you know, it was a long time ago, 30 years that I first started. Um, I would be one of maybe two yeah. Uh, people, girls out on track. Um, of course, it was in the days before social media or anything like that or the internet. I remember going to Germany once, taking my helmet off. I'd had a brilliant battle at the Nürburgring with with a German, so neither of us knew each other. Um, I took my helmet off in the Park Fermi afterwards, and he was like, "Oh my goodness, you're a girl!" Um, just, just could not. You know, couldn't he, he just couldn't idea. confuse yeah. it. Whereas now you look down and there are loads of women. I mean, you yeah. probably have, I don't know, probably at least three or four in each race. We're finding a lot more with, with purchases of classic cars as well, whereas it used to be almost 99.999% men. Actually, there's far, form, far, far more women that are much more yeah. involved either in the purchasing themselves or actually in the decision. Well, I think it's, um, I mean, I'm all for it. And it's great to see how many more women as well are racing in the modern yeah. championships as well. 
Um, how long do you think until one can? I mean, it's a, it's a, it, look, it's very hard to get into Formula One. It's not just about how good no, you are sometimes either. No, I mean, I always, I always try and describe it like using football as an analogy because mm. I think that's something people can understand. If you imagine there's, I don't know, a million little boys and yep. girls um, playing football when they're sort of little, yep. five, six, seven, who want to be a Premiership footballer. By the time they get to 16, 17, and this was where the gaps in my knowledge occur, I don't know how many Premiership teams there are, but let's, for the argument's sake, say... This eight, is 20, I think, 18, 18 or 20. 18 or 20, yeah. yeah, there we go. Each of which will have a squad of maybe... No more than 30, 40, I think it is, 40? and but, which young would be two or three, maybe. But the point is, there is lots of opportunity no. there. Yeah. So, you know, you're looking at the numbers, yeah. there is lots of opportunity. You look at Formula One and there's 20 seats. Yes. So, and at least three or four of them are, dare I say, it, sort of money seats, i.e. they're backed to get the team off the yeah. ground. So they, you, it's more about whom rather than the driver. Uh, it's very difficult. It is. And, and it's a sport where you have to be the best. You, you, can't, you can't just take a seat because it works for commercial reasons. You no. have to physically be but the best. But there's, there's another key point, and that's the route up to Formula One. Um, because currently, the way the regulations are in some of the f series prior to Formula One, Formula One's got power steering. Some of the others don't. Yeah. And that's where I think the problem comes because whether we like it or not... It's physiology again, yeah. It, it does yeah. come down to, yeah. to strength. Um, and, you know, there will be women who are very, very strong. But again, you're, 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 you're reducing yeah. those numbers. Exactly. Um, so it is just much more difficult for a woman to be competitive in some of those feeder series and thus all the way make it and all thus the way. make it to formula yeah. one yeah. however there is no reason why a woman couldn't race a formula one car in my i mean it's tough but you know you train for it and you yeah, prepare yeah. for it and yeah and then and then once and, and it's that sort of thing and it's when there's someone that is like yourself vicky who we work with when you're in the media and you're you're in cars you're driving cars and you're a personality what you do then is inspire someone to try and then once you've inspired someone to try that number in that pool increases and our chances of having women at the pinnacle of motorsport increases further yeah exactly so it's all about trying to encourage that and and really like everything and the brands if they're involved and they can back that was it charlotte tilbury the makeup brand doing the doing form uh, the, um, yes the, the, yes the, the, the women's women in, versions of exactly yeah. so you know they're getting in they're trying to promote that it, it seems odd a makeup brand in motorsport but it makes sense when you think that that's they have exposure to women and girls at a, an well, age Well this where is they where I think the the drive to survivors helped because 17 odd years ago um I tried to put an all female GT team together um to race at Le Mans and the support series around it we couldn't find a sponsor. There we were thinking yeah. this is going to be a piece of cake. They're going to be falling over us and we're going to have more money than we know what to do with. Nobody would sponsor us because female brands looked at us and were like, There's not enough female. Yeah, nobody's exactly. watching. Yeah. Um, and male brands looked at us and thought, oh no, it's a bit of a joke. Now you've got Iron Dames. Yeah. Fantastically successful. But this is where I think society has changed and also the tools to market have changed. It's because all now very clever. And, and with Drive to Survive being the perfect example, because I've sat there and watched them. I've had no interest really in motorsport at all. You know, I would sit there and watch a Formula One Grand Prix or classic races and be quite engaged in it. Emma, she'd wander off mm. into the kitchen, not really interested. We watch one series of Drive to Survive, and because you start and understanding the intricacies, the dramas, uh, oh, how the, the teams formed, and, and the, you then get to know it. Suddenly, there's you're, you're engaged. Mm. Aren't you engaged? And we know this with social media and all of our smartphones and what have you. That then you get fed more information. So then the sponsors start thinking, hang on a minute, there's a large amount of yeah. of female watchers of this. We can start feeding brands. Brands then get involved and then bang, you're there. You Absolutely. can get some sponsorship. Which is watching. fantastic. I mean, it's, it's a brilliant way of just expanding the audience. And as you say, just bringing more people in, whether it be with classic cars or racing or... Exactly that. So tell me, what would be your, your dream car to race? GT40. Yeah. I mean, but actually, I've always, I've always said I think the GT40 is the perfect car. It's just perfect in every way. Yeah. It looks beautiful. Awesome race car. Looks fantastic. You know, drive it on the road. Maybe not the same one. But <laughs> have two. Why not? You might have to. If you could afford yeah. one, you'd probably afford two, couldn't you? <laughs> and uh, and from a point of view of collections, have you got any cars at home at the moment? I do. I've got a couple of cars at the moment. I've just I just recently sold. Um, I had a 
I had a bit of an itch for an American muscle car. These itches are dangerous, They're aren't very, they? Yeah. So I bought a 1968 Camaro uh, oh. Z28. Wow. Which was awesome. Yep. I loved it. There's a butt coming in. There is a butt. It's not good on English roads. It's always the case. The uh, American cars, I absolutely love them. I I love the styling. I loved everything about it. But, you know, it's huge. No power steering. You you can't parallel park it. And then once in a while you find a nice straight road and a nice big expanse. This is fantastic. And then the next minute you're in an English country road and think, oh, no. It wasn't so much the lanes, actually. For me, it was just where to take it. And also, you know, you're sitting behind a whopping big V8 on vinyl seats <laughs> get a bit sweaty they do love the vinyl seats don't they, they? do um, so yeah so that was a bit a bit sweaty um, so I've just recently sold that but I have got a 1969 Fiat 500 nice which pleases me I mean I just drive that they just fun. they cannot not put a smile no. on your face and it's lovely you know nobody some some cars I mean I've driven old you know fan, Ferraris Fancy and stuff yep. and you know most people are nice but you occasionally get people um, who aren't so nice I mean people when I'm driving the Fiat they don't mind that I'm holding them up no they sort of give you the thumbs up and say you know, but I think that's it. something like a Fiat 500 it could be owned by someone with no money and lots of money but it's just a smile on it's face oh, complete, and it's just fun to drive as well yeah. um, so I've got that and I have a gorgeous orange 73 Alpha Montreal. Oh. Which is my. Very good. Yeah. I'm a bit of an Alpha nut. I've spent oh. way too much money on Alphas in my time. Oh. Well, should I say lost too much money on my Alphas <laughs> over the time? But well, always I'd, been I'd always wanted one. Um, and I wasn't really sure because they have a history of being unreliable and quite difficult, particularly with the Montreal. Um, a bit difficult to yeah. get the injections. You know, somebody who can actually work on the engines and know, knows what they're doing. But I finally took the plunge. But it's always a top tip, isn't it? Whenever you buy anything, especially if you buy a classic, is it's it's part of an engagement not only just with the car but with also the maintenance of the car. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're not a mechanic in yourself, and most people aren't, you know, you need to find someone that can look after the car for you. It's part of the journey. Mm-hmm. You know. You well, I found a brilliant guy who is um, bizarrely in the sort of deepest, darkest Shropshire, um, but knows these cars back to front and has got sort of four of them that he's currently rebuilding. But so. it's always the case because he will, it's about like anything, it takes him half the time to diagnose and bear in mind you've got to pay the diagnosis fee. So if it takes six hours, you're paying six hours yeah. later. But if he's very good and he can do it in an hour, he, there's your saving. Uh, exactly. The job is still the same job. But I love that car. Fantastic. Look, thank you very, very, very much for joining us. Thank you. you. fabulous race circuit on behind us. Um, I'll do a couple of shout outs at the end here. So thank you very much for watching. Um, it's brought to you with our sponsors, Hag- and of course we have an auction coming very shortly at Ascot Racecourse if you are looking to finance our partners Charles and Dean get that all sorted prior to we're on the 14th of September so please do join us and follow us on all our socials We've got a social hook that you'd like to pop in there your Instagram maybe um, A <laughs> underscore Stretton so you follow Amanda she's got some fantastic um, reels on there about the Pebble Beach oh. recently <laughs> as well it's fantastic it's well worth a watch thank you very much for joining us thank, thank you. you very much for today, and we'll see you shortly thank you very much